This morning, <clears throat> we will look at a section of Scripture. <clears throat> and I want you to know that wrapped around this section of Scripture that will be our reading is a story that reminds us of one of the ever-increasing tendencies that exist in our world today to both minimize sin and reduce its impact on our lives. It seems as if culture has won the day with its argument that right and wrong is always relative. I want to say to you this morning that neither experience nor Scripture will substantiate that perspective. And so we're going to look at another episode in the life of Elijah in which he confronts Ahab, the wicked king, regarding a specific sin, a specific sinful act, which God refused to ignore. So we're going to read in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 17 through 25, if you have your Bibles open there. <clears throat> Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is, in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, Dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you've sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I'll bring calamity on you, and I'll take away your posterity, and I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you've provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. So we pray this morning, I would remind us that certainly our hearts are clearly brought to the recognition that this world is broken as we think about the circumstances that have unfolded both in El Paso and in Dayton, Ohio, just in the last several hours. We see the result of living in a fallen world, in a broken culture. And as we pray this morning, I want us to remember the families, the communities of those who lost their lives and who are trying to somehow walk forward into this day with a brand new reality because their old reality will never be the same. And so would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer, please? Father, we come today <clears throat> in the mighty and majestic and magnificent name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even as we raise our hallelujahs because of the great salvation that you've brought to bear on our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ, we also come, Lord, with sadness in our hearts, with confusion in our minds, Lord, we can make no sense of the kind of things that go on in our world. Father, we know that you saw yesterday and today before they ever unfolded. And so we ask that you would reach toward those who need you so badly today. In all of your love and your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your comfort, and hold them close. Father, somehow, I pray that they would look to you and that you would sustain them. I, I pray for those whose, whose minds were so twisted and broken that such an act would come from them. Oh, how they need a Savior. How we all need a Savior. As we study the passage of Scripture wrapped around the life of Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth and Elijah this morning, I pray that you would help us to see that we need a Savior. 
In Jesus' name, amen. There are so many things that unfold in this life that we can't make a lot of sense out of. And surely one of those things is the story that's before us today. As we will get into it, you'll see what I'm talking about. And we will walk through this story. But it coincides with so many of the the unexplainable and uh, unthinkable circumstances and situations that have been a part of human history all the way back to the time of Cain and Abel. And I'm not just talking about the taking of life. I'm talking about the brokenness of humanity that, that results in this propensity toward sinfulness. Now, we don't much like to talk about sin in our world today because we know that if we do, that someone is likely to take offense. And we live in a no-offense society, seemingly. But when we begin to look in God's Word and we begin to analyze and examine the Scriptures, we find out that that is not the same tendency that God had because from the very onset, the very beginning of the fall of humanity, God chose to address and to confront sin head on. And He's not backed away from that stance one bit since that time. And we might ask ourselves the question, why is God so, so intent on dealing with sin? I'm going to tell you why. Here's the answer to that question. God loves us far too much not to address our sin. And so in, in all of Scripture, whenever, whenever we see God's story unfolding, when we see God's truth revealed, we look at it through eyes, not, not of, of human understanding, but hopefully through divine revelation, through divine inspiration, through divine education, where He begins to teach us and help us understand that, that there are things that are humanly beyond our scope, beyond our grasp, but God knows why He does what He does. And so God answers the question about the drastic and disastrous results of sin in our lives by saying, I love you too much to leave you there. And so in this passage of Scripture, as we'll see today, God deals with sin. And He does that in one of two ways. God deals with the sin of humanity either punitively or redemptively. And whenever we see that word punitively, we know that that's, that's sort of a legal term. And basically what that word means is that God will deal with sin either in terms of punishing its presence. And this happens, this occurs whenever those who commit sin and are charged with it and it's exposed to their heart, refuse to repent of that sin. If, repent, if, if unrepentance is the position that a person chooses to maintain, then that sin will be dealt with punitively. It'll be dealt with in judgment. The second way God deals with sin is redemptively. This is different. For those who come to God in repentance of sin upon the exposure of that sin, the realization that that sin is present, and come to Him in repentance, come to Him in confession, come to Him owning the reality of that sin in their life and the result and the impact that it has on both the heart of God and the heart of the individual, then God deals with it restoratively. He wants to restore that individual. And it's, it's always going to be one of these two ways. If we choose to hang on to our sin, it will be dealt with punitively. If we choose to release that sin to God, then it will be dealt with restoratively or redemptively. It's interesting that so many people want to know what they can bring to God or what they can give to God. And the first thing that God always asks us to bring to Him and to give to Him is our sin. He says, just bring me your sin. I want you to bring me your sin so you don't have to carry it, so I can cleanse you from it, and so you can walk through this world in rest restoration to a relationship that I've created you to experience with me. So, in this story, what we see unfolding in front of us, and we're going to walk through it, as I said, are the consequences of unrepentance portrayed in vivid fashion right before our eyes. So let's kind of see what's going on here. The story is wrapped around four particular individuals. The first individual is the man whose name is Ahab. 
we're going to call him a greedy man with great power. Now, if you back up to the first part of chapter 21 in 1 Kings, and I hope you've kept your Bibles open, you can read the story of what, un, what transpires here. There was a man whose name was Naboth. Scripture says he was a Jezreelite. In other words, he lived in the, the area of Jezreel, and he had a vineyard that was there, and it was next to the king's palace. So Ahab went to Naboth, and he said these words, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near to me, next to my house. And for it, I'll give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. So basically what happens here is that Ahab, this king, who has tremendous power, begins to desire, covet Naboth's vineyard. He wants what Naboth possesses. And, And actually he comes to Naboth and provides what seems to be something of a reasonable uh, transaction. He says, Naboth, you have this vineyard, and and it's convenient to me, and I would like to have it. In fact, I want it. I want you to give it to me. And he said, what I'll do is I'll give you a better vineyard somewhere else, or I'll give you its worth in money. And and Naboth spoke, and this is what he said in verse number 3. Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Now, Basically, on his face, it seems like this might be an unreasonable response to a reasonable request. I mean, he's offered to give him a better vineyard, right? He's offered to give him his worth in money. Why wouldn't he do this? Well, see, Naboth knew something, and he remembered something that had been passed down to him. And if you look in the center reference of your Bible, you'll see a couple of verses right there by verse 3, probably. One of those is Leviticus 25 and verse 23, where God commanded that whenever he handed land to the people, he said, you are not to sell it. You're not to get rid of it because the land is really not yours. It's mine. I'm letting you live on it for a season of time. It's not your land. And it'll be passed down to generations after you and your own family. So I, God said, I forbid you to sell this land. I forbid you to get rid of this land. And Naboth remembered that. So Naboth was not a greedy man with great power. He was a godly man with good principles. He was someone who said, you know what? You can ask me for this if you choose to. But I'm going to stand on the principles of God's command. I'm going to stand on the principles of God's word. And I'm going to deny your request. So you have a greedy man with great power whose name is Ahab, the king of the nation, a wicked king by every account. In fact, you, you read with me where it said, no one worked more wickedness in the sight of the Lord than Ahab. And so he, he comes to Naboth and he requests this vineyard. And Naboth says, nope, we're not going there. So this is followed up then by the introduction of another character that we've met along the way. Her name is Jezebel. Look at Ahab's response in verse 4. Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned his face away and would eat no food. So he's pouting in his room, on his bed, refusing to eat because he didn't get this one thing by virtue of of a man standing on the principles of God's Word. And so here he is. He's all wrapped up now in himself. He's, 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 He's pouting, he's whining, and he's not getting what he wants. He's refusing to eat. And his wife, Jezebel, comes in there. And Jezebel is what I would call a garish woman with a godless plot. And I want you to look that word up if you don't know what it means. But it basically means that she's awful. I mean, she's about as bad as they get. And, and she's, she thinks she's all that, and she has power at her disposal. And this is what Jezebel said to him. <clears throat> what is the matter with you? And so she, he tells Jezebel the story, and she says, You get up, and you exercise your authority over Israel. You arise and eat food. I'll get that vineyard for you. And so she sets about to hatch a godless plot. And let me tell you what that plot looked like. In verse 9, 8 and following, says, it says that she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, sent the letters to nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she said to this, You proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You've blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of his city did exactly that. They proclaimed the fast. The two men stood up and said, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. They took him outside the city and they stoned him with stones. And they sent word to Jezebel. And Jezebel told Ahab 
Arise, take possession of the vineyard that Naboth refused to give you, for Naboth is not alive, but he is dead. So this is, this is what's happening here. For this, this parcel of ground, you have the wicked king Ahab that wanted the land. You have Naboth who refused on the, the standard, the principle of God's word to grant it. His wife who steps in has him murdered in his own, in, in his own vineyard and, and, and then gives the, the uh, vineyard to, to Ahab. So this is, this is what's happening. Now into the middle of that story now, what we see is that God is not forgotten. God has not closed his eyes. God has not shut himself off to what's taking place here. Elijah is what I would call a gallant prophet with a very grim proclamation. This is where we picked up reading. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. And he said, Rise, go down and meet Ahab, the king of Israel. And this is what you're to say to him. Accuse him of what he's done. Have you murdered and also taken possession? And then look at what he begins to say. He, he begins to pour out, pour, lay out this grim picture. In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood. And then he, he says the same thing about Jezebel. He said that, that the dogs would eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs would eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. The birds of the air would eat whoever dies in the field. And then it gives that pronouncement about the life of Ahab, that there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Now let me tell you what's happening here. What's happening here is that, that the sinfulness of an individual who, upon several times of confrontation about his wickedness, about his sinfulness, turned a hard heart and a cold shoulder to God in refusal to repent, now is, is facing the punitive reaction of God for the sins that he committed. Now you read this, and I'm going to tell you, it just seems very, very harsh. You know why? Because it is. It is harsh. But for Ahab and his life, the way that he conducted himself, the, the tragic way that he lived, the, 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 the wickedness that he portrayed, this was sin's destination for him. This was where sin took him. See, every one of us always are on a path. Every one of us ha has a path that we're choosing every day. And I want to tell you that you can't choose a path with no expectation of consequences, no expectation of destination. And if God lays out in front of us a path and He says, here is my way, walk in it. And we choose to do that. We can expect the consequences of walking that path of righteousness. And if we have another path that's in front of us that is not the way of God and we're drawn to it by, as Ahab was, our unchecked desires, our impulses, our refusal to listen to the voice of God, whenever we choose that path, then we need to also understand that it has consequences and a destination as well. And we need to understand that, that whichever choice we make, that fortunately for us along the way, God tries to check us up. He tries to stop us. He tries to help us understand that this is not what I've appointed for you. This is not what I've designated for you. And if you'll turn now and return to me, then we can get this straight and get this right. But if you don't, then you're going to move forward into the consequences of your unrepentance, and that's going to be the punitive judgment of God on that sinfulness. And that's exactly what Ahab is facing now. Too many times he had had opportunity to bow his knee in his heart before the God of heaven. Too many times he had rejected that opportunity and said no to God. Too many times he had said, no, I will not do that. And now God is holding him accountable. God's holding him in judgment for the sin that he's committed. So this is, this is where sin took him. And, and, and our sin takes us places. It, it moves us along a continuum of ultimate consequences that we need to understand. And, and if, we, if we'd be honest with ourselves, we should readily say, I prefer what God has for me at the end of the path of righteousness or along the path of righteousness to any consequence that sin brings into my life. And you say, well, I've made some bad choices. Haven't we all? You say, well, I've, I've gotten off center with God. I've gotten 
on the wrong path along the way. In fact, I, I, it may be that you have to say, you know, I've, I've moved through my life and I've never really gotten on the path of righteousness with God. What do I do? I, I want to tell you that God has a remedy. God has a remedy, and, and I don't want you to know about that remedy today. I want you to hear from God's perspective what that remedy looks like. And so this morning, I want you to understand that there is a remedy for sin, but that remedy requires repentance from the individual. That's, that's, that's the key to it all. It's coming to the place of, of being willing to turn from that sin and return to God or turn to God in fresh measure and to look Him in the face and say, God, it's you that I desire. It's you that I want. So in order for us to understand that, I want us to just take a little bit of a journey through this process and this pathway of repentance. And the first thing I want you to understand about that is that before you can fully understand it, you have to sort of view time from the perspective of eternity. Before you can understand the punitive or redemptive work of God in dealing with our sin, you have to view time from the perspective of eternity. See, here's the deal. There was never a moment in time or eternity that God was not aware of the sin problem. Never. Even before creation, even before time began, there was never a moment that God was not fully cognizant that humanity would turn from Him and turn to their own desires and their own ways and choose that which was not God. And, and so what we see is that in His awareness, God always knew that this was going to happen. And, 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 and He always knew what would result from it. And he always knew what it would take to provide a remedy for it. See, the truth is that, and, 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 and here's what I mean by viewing time from the perspective of eternity. We can't come to the place where we ever believe that God saw sin happen and then decided what the remedy would be. That's not how it worked. Amen. See, the truth is that whenever God saw from eternity that sin would happen, we need to recognize that the remedy that God provided is the preemptive love of God on display. It was God who acted before time to set in place exactly what was going to take place or have to take place for our sin to be dealt with. And the reason that that was what was set in place is because that's the only thing that could change it. It's the only thing that could remedy it. It's the only thing that could bring any kind of a process of renewal or redemption or salvation or restoration to our lives. It wasn't that God had a, a list of options on the table and chose the one thing of sending His Son. It's the only thing that could matter. It's the only thing that could help. So in, in sending His Son, the preemptive love of God was on display. It was God acting before the act, before the deed of sin ever occurred to address the situation that He knew was going to unfold. It was God getting out in front of the problem that He knew was coming. I'll raise a hallelujah. Amen. I'm telling you what. For God to do that for me, for God to do that for us, it really is an amazing display of a love beyond words. So to think about that. See, and, and, and again, we can't try to put ourselves in the place of God because we'll never be able to think like He does. But from a human perspective, if I would have seen what was going to happen before it happened and knew what, what it was going to cost me before it cost me, you know what I'd have said? I don't need that headache. I'm just not going to create them. If that's what they're going to do, if that's what it's going to cost me, I'm not going to do it, but not God. You know why? Because He loves us. He loves this humanity that He's created. He loved this humanity that is birthed in His heart from before time began. And He loves us. And He reached toward us even before the problem occurred. That's amazing to me. So we need to view time from the perspective of eternity to understand the remedy. We have to recognize that it's the preemptive love of God on display. It's not a stopgap measure or a solution that came up in the moment. This is something that was always in place. And then we need to accept, thirdly, that the remedy is absolutely essential and is not just an elective measure from God. When, when we begin to think about what God did in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to realize that this was not some maniacal act by an angry deity. This was the law of justice that, that exists in the heart of God that was being handled and dealt with the only way that it could be. The justice of God had to be satisfied. And so the justice of God was, was handled there on the cross as our sin was placed on Jesus there he dealt with the justice required by the law of God. Now again, the law was not something 
that was made up along the way. The law is eternal. It existed in the heart of God, in the nature of God. It's the way things are. God knew before sin ever happened where it would take people and what it would take to get them out of it. And so he took care of that before the fact because that justice had to be satisfied. But it was also the grace of God being poured out. Because in that moment, we see that the law of God requiring justice took place, but we also see that God poured his grace out in order to bring us into an, an opportunity for forgiveness and mercy that we had no way of deserving. And so this was, this was not an option, again, among many options. This was the only way that all of that could take place. It was not an elective measure. It was a, a must on the part of God. The fourth thing we need to know about the remedy of God for the sin of our heart is this, that what God proposes is available, but it's not automatic. See, God brings to us the opportunity to choose him. God is not going to force himself on us. God is not going to make us choose for him. He's going to give us the opportunity, the option. And, and, and it's like one said, it's like the devil is out to destroy me and God is out to save me and I get to cast the deciding vote. Okay? And here's the deal. Every one of us, certainly every one of us in this room today, who understands that it is through Jesus Christ, God's own Son, that redemption can occur, has today the opportunity to make a choice. Because what God has provided is not automatic, but if we choose to say yes to Jesus, if we choose to repent of our sin, if we choose to confess our sin, if we choose to release our sin to Him, to bring Him our sin, and to give Him our heart and surrender, and, and trust Him for forgiveness then he will wash your sins away. You say, how can he do that? <laughs> He's God. He can do anything. He can save you. you. You know how I know that? Because he saved me. And I tell you, if he can save me, he can save anybody. So looking at all of this, what we see is a man who chose to pursue his path of unchecked desire and whenever he was confronted with that, chose to live with unconfessed sin. In other words, he chose to hold on to his sin rather than let God deal with it. I wonder how many of us would have that same story here today. And I'm talking about Christians first. And we, we, read, we read the verses a few minutes ago from 1 John that if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as His children, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But that if we confess is the place that we have to, to go to get that sin taken care of, to get that cleansing from the sin that we commit. And so the question is, are we choosing daily to cling to our sin, or are we willing to bring it to Him? See, the truth is that if we've got a sin problem in our lives, that sin problem needs to be dealt with. And I want to tell you something, it needs to be dealt with sooner rather than later. In fact, it needs to be dealt with now and not later. Because God's ex explaining to us the process. He's laying it out in front of us so that we are without excuse. So, the second part of this, this idea is that if, if you're here today and, and you've never brought your sin to the Lord initially, you've never confessed Christ as your Savior, then I'm telling you what, that sin is a weight on your life that's going to drag you right down to the pit of hell if you don't bring it to Him. And, and, and that's, that's just Bible. That's not me making something up to try to scare you. That's, that's the Word of God. And so you need to come to the place, we need to come to the place where we say about our sin, whatever it brings to my life, it's not worth it, and I'm willing to release it and place it in the hand of the one who can handle it and set me free. And then we can sing, I've been redeemed. I've been set free. I'll break off these heavy chains. And every stain will be wiped away, and I won't be who I used to be because I've been redeemed. I hope that's your story this morning. I hope that you're not like Ahab and Jezebel, who decided, and by the way, 
I wish that we had time to continue and to go forward because you'll see that everything that Elijah promised was going to happen did happen. In fact, when Ahab came to the point of his death, he was in the middle of a battle, and it was, guess where? Right beside the vineyard. And they threw his body into that vineyard, and there the dogs came. And they licked his blood out of the, uh, out of the, the, the chariot that he had been in. Then Jezebel, the wife, was thrown down from the, the walls, the ramparts of Jezreel into the street by some men who opposed that wicked regime. And the scripture says the dogs ate her there, just like Elijah promised. See, we can, we can try to convince ourselves that God's word will not happen. But I'm going to tell you something, every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. Every aspect of God's word will come to pass. So, my prayer for you this morning is that you'll commit yourself to a life of short accounts with God. As a believer, that you'll keep your record clear, that you'll stay confessed up. And secondly, my prayer for you is if you're here this morning and you've not trusted Jesus, oh, would you come to Him today? He, he stands ready to forgive you. He stands ready to cleanse you. He stands ready to give you new life, eternal life, but if you believe on his name. Father, we come now in Jesus' name. <laughs> We're thankful that we can come in his name because he is our mediator, he is our redeemer, he is our savior, and he is our king. And so as we have sung about the opportunities for redemption and forgiveness in song today, we've spoken about that in the preaching of your word, and I ask that it's penetrated every one of our hearts to the point to where we would refuse to leave this room with any known sin in our lives, whatever that means for any of us. So God, please lead us in these moments to respond to you, to your spirit, as you prompt us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing? Sure.